Hey everybody, it's Timothy here again, and we're getting ready to go live on Twitch for the Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition final round. Super exciting, I know. Each night we're gonna be joined by a past laureate of the competition to have discussions and conversations starting Monday with Remy Janier, Tuesday with Takashi Sato, Wednesday with Mariangelo Vacatello and Christine Lee, Thursday with my own brother, Nikki Chewy, Friday with Henry Kramer, and Saturday with David Fung. We're also gonna have exclusive interviews with the finalists themselves right off the stage, so make sure you don't miss that. Also gonna have special guests, inspiring guests such as Marion Aslov join us in conversation. So make sure you join us and follow us on the Twitch channel and you won't miss a beat. I'll see you there. Hey everybody, it's Timothy here again and we're getting ready to go live on Twitch for the Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition final round. Super exciting, I know. Each night we're gonna be joined by a past laureate of the competition to have discussions and conversations starting Monday with Remy Janier, Tuesday with Takashi Sato, Wednesday with Mariangelo Vacatello and Christine Lee, Thursday with my own brother Nikki Chewy, Friday with Henry Kramer and Saturday with David Fung. We're also gonna have exclusive interviews with the finalists themselves right off the stage, so make sure you don't miss that. Also gonna have special guests, inspiring guests such as Marion Aslov join us in conversation. So make sure you join us and follow us on the Twitch channel and you won't miss a beat. I'll see you there. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. My name is Timothy Chewy, and welcome back to the third night of the final round of the Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition 2021, where we're streaming live on Twitch for the first time ever. You guys know how this works. Please type in where you guys are watching and tuning in from. And also, if you were here on Monday and Tuesday, would love to know where you're coming from and shout out to whoever is coming from Canada. I'm here right now in Montreal. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Timothy Chewy. I was the second prize winner of the 2019 Queen Elizabeth competition for violin. And believe it or not, that was the last edition, even though it felt somewhat like eons ago, but that was the last edition because last year 
it was COVID-19 and we could not have a competition. So we've had to adapt this year's competition to make sure that everything was safe. And that's why we're doing everything online. All right, so who do we have here? All right, so we have someone coming from Somers Point, New Jersey. I know where that is. All right, from Belgium, Italia. Great, Ontario. You're my neighbor right there. Okay, more from Belgium. That's awesome. Lots of Belgians up here. This is great. That's awesome. Good, giving some good support. And those of you who are just joining in for the first time, I'll give a little brief explanation of what the Queen Elizabeth competition is. It's an international competition. I believe it's one of the oldest violin, um, international competitions in the world, originally for violin and piano and has expanded to voice and piano over the decades. And it is a really, really important one for young artists to take part in as for those who are aspiring to have an international career as a uh, violin soloist, piano soloist, cello soloist, um, as a singer. This is the big stepping stone that can make or break your career because there's so much international attention to it. And you look at the past laureates who have been previous winners. They are some of the biggest names in the classical music industry. So this year it's piano already. And for those of you that have not uh, been able to join with us, the Twitch streams from Monday and Tuesday are available on the Twitch website as well, Queen Elizabeth Competition. Tonight, we are going to be sharing the experiences with our guests about what it was like to take part in the competition, what it was like to prepare for it, what was it like to actually be in the competition, and how has it changed their lives going forward. We're also going to be talking about the future of what we think the competition is going to look, look like after COVID. Um, we're also going to be commenting on our contestant tonight that's performing, and we'll get to more of that later. And interviewing him, we're going to have an exclusive interview with him right after his performance. And of course, this is a Twitch stream. So please, please, please write your thoughts below in the chat comments. I'm happy to read them out. Questions and answers, please blast them as much as we can. Or we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. If you have any questions for the guest tonight or the finalist, we will make that a priority to make sure that you get answers. All right, so let's have fun tonight. and. I want to introduce our guests. Uh, we have Mariangela Vacatello, who is the past laureate of the Queen Elizabeth competition in 2007. And we have Christine Lee, which was also a very close friend of mine. We went to school together for a couple of years and we've um, interacted with each other over the past couple of years as well. Uh, she was the laureate of the Queen Elizabeth cello competition in 2017. So. Welcome to both of you. Mariangela, thank you for coming here. Can you please introduce yourself and just tell us where you are right now and maybe one fun fact about you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mariangela Vacatello. I was in the Queen Elizabeth in 2007. I was a laureate piano. And uh, actually, I am not at home because my hometown is in Perugia, but I'm in Milan at my parents. <laughs> so I'm working with their uh, computer and microphone. Very, very happy to be with you and thanks for the invitation. Of course. So just tell us one quick word or a, a sentence. What was, what was your memory of the Queen Elizabeth competition when you did it? Well, I have a wonderful memories and I remember all my friends and uh, they were contestants. I am still in touch with uh, uh, sometimes with Anna Viniskaya that was the first winner um, or Soyan Lee or uh, even Librit uh, from Bekevort. Uh, and oh, yes. actually last July we will be together in a, in a new piano lab in uh, the castle Alden Wiesen. I'm very, very excited to collaborate with him again. And uh, I still remember the seven days in the chapel preparing the contemporary. <laughs> so wonderful memories, really. Great competition. Great. Wonderful memories. That's awesome. Really happy to have you on here. Thank you for joining us all the way from Italy. And Christine, could you please introduce yourself to the audience here? And what was your memories of the Queen Elizabeth competition in 2017? And Audience, please take note that she took part in the first cello competition ever. Hello, everyone. Um, I am connecting from Seoul, Korea, actually. And I am Christine. And um, I was so um, excited 
<laughs> to when I found out that the Queen Elizabeth competition was going to have a cello division. I was super excited. And I think it will be forever one of the most special experiences that I've I've had in my life. Yeah, it's having um, experienced that. It's amazing. I mean, I remember when the news came out that they were doing a cello competition, I literally felt the shock wave of all my cellist friends just being like, this is crazy. For the first time, they're actually paying attention to us. And I feel like that was actually one of the most competitive competitions out there with a stellar star jury. I remember seeing the list and which is like, oh my goodness, these are all superstars on here. And it's really incredible. And all of you, I think, were playing at such an incredible levels like everybody had their unique interpretation and was so confident i just remember so many people tuning in we'll get more to that later on and just to explain a little bit about how this competition works it's a goal that's kind of that gold star that we all reach for when we're really young as we see it online and and see it streamed previously even before covid and it's it's a month-long competition it usually is I, w I would usually say it's one of the last competitions people tend to do, or at least in later in their careers of competitions, because it's usually the one that launches uh, the young artists into the real world of performing and touring and international performances. So basically, we send in a tape about, I would say, six months before the actual competition happens. We find out the results two months in, and then we're given a, a, a few pieces. Uh, we're given uh, the options of preparing our own semifinal recital. We're given a contemporary piece, um, two actually. So one for the semifinal and then one for the final. But the final one, uh, if we get to the finals, what happens is you enter the chapelle, which is basically uh, a beautiful, I mean, it's, it's new and renovated now, but it's a beautiful, almost kind of a dorm. And you stay there for one week, seven days, no cell phone, no internet, no communication with the outside world. And you're given a brand new piece, a concerto or a commissioned work, usually lasting between 10 to 30 minutes. My year was 30 minutes. I know uh, some other people were 10 to 15 minutes, but you have no reference of what this sounds like. So it's basically up to you to learn that piece and make something out of it. And you only have seven days to learn it. That's, for those of you who don't know, that's a very, very short amount of time to actually process and learn a new piece. Plus on top of that, you have to prepare your romantic concerto, which probably is you know, one of the most exciting things that we can do as an, as an artist, as, a, as an instrumentalist. But imagine the stress of learning a brand new piece and preparing a staple of a concerto at its highest quality at the same time with no outside communication. So that's a little brief background. Any questions, comments, feel free as well. Those of you just joining in, put in the chat box. So I have a question for both of you. Um, Christine, why don't we start with you? Were you keeping up with this year's competition so far? And what do you think about the whole situation of you know COVID and not having an audience? Did you feel like mm -hmm. playing on stage with an audience made a big difference? because right now we don't have an audience. Right, I mean, I have, I think so many points that I like to address with that question, but I was following the competition here and there a little bit because I have a few um, friends who are actually in the finals. <laughs> so I'm very excited for them. And of course, this is such an unprecedented time and for, the, for this, um, competition to be online, I think until last minute, we weren't really sure if it was going to take place. And when I found out that it was going to take place, in fact, I was extremely excited. Of course, I think having the live audience, you cannot, we cannot replace that because I think performing, it's, it's such an essential part of performing that we share and we communicate and we cannot have it's sort of like talking to a wall almost if we don't have that energy to feed off on. But having said that, I think still having the opportunity to get on stage and having, having a very specific goal in mind at a time where things were just, uh, where things became very confusing and uncertain, I think it gave a lot of um, comfort to those who, well, we're preparing probably since last year. 
Absolutely. I think you said so many of the, the golden points right there. It is unprecedented and it really does feel like, I mean, for those of you, I'm sure many of you in the audience have been having to film stuff and talk to the camera. You guys know how weird that is, right? It's basically the same when we're playing on stage without an audience. We do Having an interview or a conversation to feel so natural, but to talk to a camera or to talk to a wall, you actually mess up so much and you feel like it's just it doesn't feel natural and it shouldn't be natural because that's not exactly what we do. But that being said, I think the Queen Elizabeth competition has been extremely innovative to actually make this follow through because most of them have been canceled. And to have this Twitch stream, I think it was a really cool way to interact with audiences who even might not have ever heard of this competition before. So Mary Angela, what about you? Have you been following the, this year's competition? Do you have any friends? What do you well, expect uh, have, that this is going to look like? Well, I have uh, I've listened something, not too much, because uh, in the last days, I luckily I started to play a little bit after months of silence. So um, I I had three concerts in the last week, and um, and so um, I couldn't stay always at the computer to follow the competition. But um, well, of course, the public is something very very important for music and for moving art. Uh, uh, in a way, um, we communicate uh, uh, to someone. Of course, competition is not only a concert, if, even if we have to think like a concert. But uh, competition is something, as Christine said, that we prepared a lot uh, for such a great achievement. So the concentration, uh, personally, is very, very strong. So, of course, the public gives you energy and is important to be supported by applauses or people around. But at the same time, we are very, very focused. Also, in my year in 2007, I remember that we also prepared uh, one more piece. I don't know if in your time, probably not. We prepared also the classical sonata, an extra piece. So in the seven-day chapel, we had to prepare uh, the classical sonata, one of the six uh, Beethoven choice and uh, plus the contemporary concerto and uh, the big romantic. So very, very concentrating a week. <laughs> wow, I remember that. that. I remember even when some of the previous contestants, they had an extra sonata to play. Actually, we have footage of your performance that we're going to share of both of you. But what's interesting <laughs> especially is because I don't think the 2007 competition was as publicized as 2009. There we go. Wow! <laughs> Look at you! Wonderful concerto. I still love yeah. it. <laughs> you look very young. <laughs> <laughs> you look the same to my eyes. <laughs> How old were you here? Three? I mean, you look oh, so young yeah, here. It was in 2000, well, should I tell you? <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, I realize I should not ask that question, but you look very young there. I mean, you look the same in my eyes. I was, I, I was 24, I think. Okay. Look at you, just like laser focused. And born, Did you play this concerto? Yes, Have you, before you went on this stage, you played it many times before, right? Well, few, few. No, I mean, okay. more, maybe three, four, five. Yeah. Oh, here's the end. <laughs> yes.
Uh -huh. Oh, that adrenaline rush. That adrenaline rush, right? Wow. It's so powerful. <laughs> and we have a clip of Christine as well. So those of you who are just joining in, let's see if you remember Christine. Listening to yourself is always... <laughs> It's it's horrible. The, the I'm sorry. I really apologize. Much <laughs> what's much better, my my Angela? The sound, you know. Ah. Years later. <laughs> and what's interesting is I think you guys played with Brussels Philharmonic, right? Instead of Belgian National yeah. Orchestra. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. The radio, radio, yes, radio television. Mm -hmm. How about you? Which orchestra did you play with? Me. I play with the Belgian yes. National Orchestra. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, what we will hear tonight? Yes. I feel right. like they do it every year except for cello. I feel like cello is that one off year where they do it with the Brussels Phil, but of course that could change as well in the future. Right. I thought they used to always just alternate, but I might be yeah. wrong. I'm well, not sure. Oh, that was awesome. Um, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna hear. <laughs> yeah, for those of you, um, yeah, we're okay. The jury's coming down now, so we didn't get a chance in the past streams to really just talk about the jury. But we have some pretty, pretty amazing juries this year. I mean, I can't name them all right now, but uh, one that really sticks out to me is Shai Wozner, and there's also uh, Tejin Kim, and uh, oh, now we have the Queen coming in as well. I guess she's coming alone tonight. On Monday, she came with King Philippe. Okay. Should we be standing up as well? <laughs> um, well, okay, it passed. <laughs> yeah, we passed. Okay. There's Stephanie. Wow. So, you know, we're not we're not going to hear her talk, but tonight's cont cont contestant is Keigo Mukawa, and he's from Japan originally. He was born in 1993, just like I was. Oh, it's funny. Just like me now. <laughs> so let's just share his media clip that we have right now. Oh, actually, maybe not. We're gonna we're gonna change it a little bit this time. But we'll just explain what uh, what Kego has been doing. So he studied with Frank Braley, who was uh, previously a contestant at the Queen Elizabeth competition thirty years ago. And I guess we'll, we'll put in his media um, little portrait that we have at the Chappelle usually uh, later on in the show tonight. So for those of you joining in, we're going to start with the compulsory piece that's given to the contestants right when they enter the Chappelle. And I've heard it twice already. So I'm interested in how you both find this new piece. It sounds very, very ethereal. Someone yesterday said it sounded very French. And I think that it's really interesting because even though it's a piano piece, it's written in one line, kind of like for violin or cello, and they have to figure out mm -hmm. where right and left hand goes. You know, before mm -hmm. we we let them go to Kago, do you remember what it was like, you know, just very briefly, uh, Christine, when we start with you, when you got that piece, what was the first impression that you had when you got that piece? Honestly, that week, before, was bloody hard, I have to say. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect, and I think there's no way you can prepare for it beforehand. You just have to dive in and hope for the best. And the comforting thing is you're not alone. You're doing it together. That's true. <laughs> and That's true. you have to just believe in yourself and just, just do it. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to hear yours, Mary Angela, but let's let Kago play a little bit first. So let's listen to the first two to three minutes, just what this sounds like. I'm interested to know what you guys think afterwards, too.
Okay, so we've got a little taste of what this piece is like so far. It's very ethereal, as you can tell. Very much about the sonorities of sound and resonance. Mariangela, when you got your piece in 2007, do you remember what the name was? And also, what was your first experience when you got it? And how did you approach that mentality? Well, uh, yes, I remember it because the, the title was very, in a way, romantic. It was called La Luna y la Muerte, a little bit like Granada's piece. <laughs> and the composer was um, Galvez Taronger. He was a Spanish composer. And, um, well, we, uh, as you said already, we have in the semifinal already a contemporary piece that you can that you will receive one month early in 2007 it was like that and um I've, I've been very very curious about the contemporary music always and especially in the last years i uh, achieve much much more and uh, um, but my impression that week was uh, very stressful <laughs> Because of course, the, the, there were not only one line, but three or four, five lines, <laughs> very different oh. of what I was waiting. For. A lot of resonance and um, uh, and a big cadenza in the middle as well. And uh, so I was a little stressed, but with um, we had a, a very um, we had a great um, collaborate cooperation, I can say. I remember very well that we were help, uh, helping each other in the big room with the pianos. And uh, so we tried, I, actually, I remember that I was the first because uh, it was, uh, remember, every each day one contestant entered in the chapel and I was the first one, so I started first. And uh, so mm -hmm. I had the score, uh, uh, at the beginning, and, uh, but I was very stressed. At the uh, you know, tempos, everything was different from the standard repertoire. So, but also Absolutely. exciting, you know, because I mean, you you are not alone. You are with an orchestra, so you at, a, at some point you have to go and uh, rehearse with them as professional, real professional. Exactly. It gives you a taste of the real world because that's what we have to do sometimes. You can't just focus on, you know, your Prokofiev concerto for six weeks without any distraction. You have to learn new pieces sometimes and it just, it helps you with getting used to the real world. We have a question here and they are asking, uh, let's ask Mary Angela. So is, does anyone in your year, did anyone in your year memorize the piece? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the, the question. Did anyone in your year of the competition, did they memorize the compulsory piece? You mean the, the first one or the, 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 the final one? The final one. Um, uh, no, in the final we all had the score, but also because, you know, there was the orchestra. I remember that in the semifinal, me and Anna Viniskaya were the only two playing by memory without score wow. in the semifinal. But uh, in the orchestra, wow. you know, my hat. One was with the orchestra. Was yeah. With the orchestra. What about you, Christine? In your year, did anyone memorize the piece? I have a feeling that one of at least one of us did, but I'm not completely sure. I think we need to go back to the footage and <laughs> check. And um, I know that there are not just in the cello division, but there were some people in the past that that. Um, who's definitely memorized the last um, concerto. I think it's a little bit more common for the competitors to memorize the piece for the semifinal round because also you have it for, for a month instead of, instead of a week. And I think for me, when I was preparing it that week, I try to tell myself that it's not, there's no reason to put extra pressure on myself just because someone else is memorizing it um, that I don't have to necessarily perform by memory because I don't think that's what um, that's not what actually music is about and that's not what the jury's act uh, actually looking for I think I think it's definitely changed I think there was an era at one point where especially back in the 80s and 70s where people were like 
everybody's got to memorize it. And they were all pressuring each other. When I did it, there was one rascal that didn't memorize it. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> I was just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but he was, he, uh, it was, it was pretty cool. You're making us look bad. Like, yeah, you're making us look bad. Because also he was just like, you know, I don't know. But then he just went on there and memorized it. I was like, uh, oh, yeah. I don't know how you did it. It's it's so stressful already just to even learn the piece and yet to have to memorize it because we don't even know what it really sounds like. All right, one question here from Kawa BXL. The orchestra is more smaller this, uh, smaller this year. Is that a, is that change? I think grammar is not quite right, but um, does that change a lot for the player? Um, that's a good question. I think definitely I did notice that on the first day. It was only well the first day we had got already Tchaikovsky concerto and it was quite small I think from my experience having a small orchestra for a romantic piece can definitely feel a little bit thin in my opinion but but so far this this interpretation I'm just coming from someone that watched twice in a row it definitely does seem like he's emphasizing with more time and expansion what do you uh Christine what do you think about this piece so far my so how I judge um, music of our time is literally, I think, based on my first impression and instinct. And so far, I really like it. It's very atmospheric. And I especially like the part before we started talking, um, there was the, what is that instrument called? The big gong? Uh, the gong? The gong. the gong is it the gong yeah and there were a few times that really i think separated what we're listening to now to what came before i think right now it's more involved and there are more different textures whereas um earlier before the gong there was um it was much more sparse and i mean i i know a lot of people like to describe certain music as oh that sounds very french or you know that's very german or um, such uh, such things, but I think if we can have an attitude of just listening to it as more of a of a piece itself, and based on our experiences, what we can relate to from the sounds that we we may know, I think it helps us um, understand modern music better. Absolutely. I agree with you. Let's just have an open mind and just not give any preconceived ideas of what this belongs to or categorize it as. So let's let's spend the last, it's gonna end in a minute or so. So let's just hear the ending of this piece.
Bravo. Come on, Twitch channel. Let's clap for let's clap let's clap for him. <laughs> All right. So Mariangela, I want to ask you. We're going to transition into his choice of the romant or the big concerto, which is Prokofiev's second piano concerto. Can you just brief up brief us a little bit? What can we expect from this concerto? And what does the, you played number three for yours? And how is the second concerto viewed as? And what can the listener listen to? Well. Um, uh, during my competition times, the Prokofiev third was much, much more appreciated as a concerto. But then suddenly the Prokofiev two uh, took places, even if it's much longer, <laughs> actually. And um, of course, it's a demanding uh, concerto. Very, very interesting. The big uh, is kind of, um, let's say, something like a Brahms second in a way, even the structure of the four movements are in that way. Uh, the beautiful thing is um, the first movement that um, has a lot of um, uh, start with a kind of atmosphere, uh, kind of like a pasakaya, let's say, and, uh, and the very different in the end with the um, colossale cadenza is a big, big, a huge cadenza for piano solo. And um, this is extremely demanding in powerful in voicing. And um, uh, well, the difference between the, the second and the third is mainly the structure of the form. Uh, the third concerto was much, is much more um, um, uh, focused uh, like a kind of a romantic concerto and um, it's, a, it's a, a growing of energy every in every movement so from the first to the second that is variation and the third as we were listening a very very energetic compact you know it, it, compact energy <laughs> and the second is much more you know as as a big form so with high and low even if always very very difficult mm -hmm. okay i so find very forward... if i can say if i can say i found very very interesting um his playing of the compulsory piece and um, i was also listening and uh, i find uh, him very clear and at the same time, he was really trying to go with the orchestra. You know, in contemporary music, um, we are because we don't know the pieces really, so we have to build them, uh, to build their career actually. Mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so we need to, of course, to listen many times. But at the same time, we have to go together with the orchestra. So this is why Dvorak or Prokofiev or Beethoven or whatever is coming better and better because we have we are very confident. And uh, we can uh, uh, focus on all the details. Exactly. All right. So let's listen to um, let's listen to Kago perform this second piano concerto by Prokofiev. Thanks for briefing us, Mary Angela. Let's give this a couple minutes.
Okay, that's a nice introduction to this concerto. We have a question here from Otterhouse22. What do you think about the limited amount of choices for different concertos? Can you win with Saint-Saëns concerto, with Nippon Makamo, or McDowell piano concerto? I don't know the other two actually, but Christine, when you did the competition, did they give you an open choice of the concerto? Do you remember, or was it just a list of what you could choose from? I'm pretty sure that it was free choice um, for us, but I think it was definitely part of a discussion whether or not to give us actually a list because, I mean, I really love this question because in a way, if you give us this free choice, then of course, even um, having, making a certain choice says something about you as an artist. And I think there's a lot you can tell from that. But at the same time, these concertos are so, I mean, it, they're so different in nature that I think certain concertos you cannot compare. Um, and because nature of the competition is that you do have to compare <laughs> people and their, their interpretation and their um, music making. So uh, I think it's this long time question that what is the ideal situation in making um, a choice for your final piece as a concerto. That's, that's so true. I, I do believe that it's really hard to compare some concertos with each other. For violin, it always, even if there's a free choice, it somehow always boils down to Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, Brahms, and maybe Shostakovich. Is there one, is there like a particular set of lists? Like even if you give a free choice and your year in particular, was there like a common trend of which concertos were being programmed and chosen by the finalists? Certainly, certainly. I think for cello, it's usually between Dvorak. You'll always hear Dvorak and Shostakovich one. Even though he wrote two concertos, it's number one is the go-to choice. And out of the 12 finalists, there were six Shostakovich maybe, or seven even, <laughs> more than half <laughs> wow. played Shostakovich. And the reason for that is it's so, it's so visceral, this Shostakovich first cello concerto. So you can make a certain impact that you might not make with a concerto like Schumann, for instance. Mm. I mean, but it's really comparing dogs to cats mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. There are animals, but <laughs> They're so different. And trying to compare something that's just in their nature so different, I think is, I think it's a very difficult um, job that the jury members have to go through, but yeah, what can you do? Totally, <laughs> exactly. Mariangela, our piano Sherpa, how can you help guide us into the piano world of how does one choose their piano concerto for the final round? And how did you end up choosing Prokofiev third violin concerto. Is there, I'm mean, sorry, not violin concerto, piano concerto. Was there a trend of which concertos tended to be picked? Can you win with something like Saint-Saëns piano concerto? Well, this is, I, I agree with Christina. It's a very nice question and uh, even a little difficult. Um, uh, yes, as I told you, uh, there was some uh, fashion uh, of concertos like, for example, Rachmaninoff uh, third or Prokofiev third. Of course, uh, there are a few uh, situations. So first of all, um, of course, you have to compete. So even for judge, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult if you are if you play totally diff different concertos. So um, they also need something to balance they need some balanced information. You have a, a lot of free choice uh, also during your solo repertoire, so probably you can choose uh, more in that area. Um, but I remember in 2007, uh, the list of the piano concertos was very, very, very big. I remember probably there were more than 12 concertos, uh, so a big choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure that the list was pretty big. Uh, for example, almost all Rachmaninoff, or maybe all five, uh, even Prokofiev, probably there were two or three, probably. And uh, plus, uh, 
um, Mendelssohn, Chopin, Liszt, uh, and probably even Saint-Saëns, but I'm not pretty sure. Of course, um, we um, there are some there is there is some repertoire that is very important for the history and for an artist and uh, the meaning you know of the work sometimes is you can feel that is much more deep than other music so even this uh, can be an appeal for juror or less you know a little bit so um, definitely um, there must be balance between uh, the help for the jury and uh, something with your characteristic of course if you play prokofiev or rachmaninoff you can choose the one that is more close to you there are some differences they are not the same so at the same time we have to think to the orchestra to the to the conductor i mean already at 10 concertos or more uh, in the list playing with someone that they don't know or maybe they know only for one time for a short rehearsal uh, and to play with the um, now with six finalists, but in my time and maybe your time as well, it's with 12 people. So 12 interpretation in the same days, maybe in the same day sometimes. Hmm? And it's, it's not easy, you know, for the orchestra and uh, it's very demanding for them as well. So, so we have to consider these two. But of course, McDowell, piano concertos, piano concerto, and Hummel and Sensan are very demanding piano concertos, very technical, very virtuoso. So it's not about the easy concerto, it's not about that. It's just to balance a few things. Somehow I think oh, we lost you, Timothy. So, didn't oh, I'm you. back. I was I was <laughs> muted because I was trying to uh, listen. But I was just saying that somehow I think that when you're playing uh, for violin, the Tchaikovsky's, my night was a Tchaikovsky and then my Tchaikovsky, but yet it was two completely different styles. So let's, let's listen to Keigo play some more. And then I want to ask a little bit more about your, the, the impact that this competition has done to both of you after. Let's, let's listen a little bit more of Keigo so we can understand his musicality.
difficult it sounds already. It's crazy from what I'm hearing all of these acrobatic features of the fingers, Mary Angela, I'm sure. Yeah, Have you played this all, concerto before? It's all unisono. No, I've never played. I tried it, but not playing yet. But uh, it's a beautiful concerto. Can, did you hear the, the end of the Colossale, the Colossal Cadenza? Uh, yes. that uh, put together uh, several themes and um, and they start as the beginning so it's very very is wonderful and you know that the concerto was uh, written uh, very shortly and then was uh, the score was burned so oh, he why? had to write it again in around 10 years let's say so he said that he was composing another concerto basically <laughs> but um, no. So long life, long life. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I'm just looking at his his face, and he looks pretty calm. He looks very focused very and I, I, yeah. very concentrated. And you have to be. So I do want to get back to the question of how has this competition impacted your life, your career immediately after, but also further on, Mary Angela? Since you did this in 2007, can you tell us a little bit what happened after the, the night you played or even the week after you played and also five years ten years and even now well um just immediately i was uh, very well prepared for everyone everything <laughs> i had very very um uh, i was focused a lot and um i got some concert and then i was preparing for the van Cliburn piano competition in texas so um, I, after the Queen Elizabeth, I did two more competition in, uh, um, in actually three. I did the, uh, the no the Van Cliburn and uh, the um, the top of the world piano competition in Norway. So um, mm. I was preparing for these two competition, and um, and then I was uh, I studied in London. I finished my study in uh, the Royal Academy, and uh, then I I. I I was a finalist at the Van Cliburn and uh, Worldwide uh, Audience Award. So I had five years managing management uh, in the uh, United States. So I was struggling around uh, for many, many concerts with the orchestra. Well, I want to know more about that. And we'll, we'll talk more a little bit about how your experience in the U.S. was, and especially Texas. That's kind of a weird place to have an international competition, isn't it? But we'll talk about that later. But uh, do you... Do you feel like the, the effects of the Queen Elizabeth competition in 2007, has it affected you even to this day? Or would you say it's kind of, it, it built you up for the, the other competitions? Well, no, I think it helped a lot to build uh, for yeah. other competitions, but not only, even as I told you before, uh, for a professional, because I think the experience in the chapel, I think is unique and is, um, is is really fantastic for many aspects. Um, yeah. Firstly, you 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 um, you do a new work by yourself. It's a contemporary. Mm -hmm. You don't have professor. You have nothing. You have yourself and all your experience, personal experience, and musical, mm -hmm. of course, musical personal experience. And at the same time, um, is a contemporary, so a different language of was uh, we were we are a bit for competition yes, we were yeah. really young so i was 24 not i mean not so i mean i was i was playing a lot of concert but i could not call career you know um mm -hmm. and um uh, and at the same time uh, you also i also worked with a colleague so i think the queen elizabeth is very is very much improving as a professional first of all so i think it's a special competition for that i think the week is something unique and special yeah, absolutely. And Christine, I want to know about your experience because that was quite recent. Even though it doesn't, it does. I mean, technically, it was four years ago. It feels more like two or three years in my mind. How has the competition impacted your career, your life, and everything? Because I know that you you lived in Brussels for a while, and then you're still commuting back and forth. And tell us what does that ecosystem of being in Belgium, having done the competition, studying in Belgium from Korea before and also at Curtis at, in Philadelphia at Juilliard. Tell us, what did the competition exactly do to you? I actually would like to, I mean, I 
really agree a lot with what Maria Angela has said about the week um, that we have at Chapelle, at the chapel, of how that experience is very unique to the Queen Elizabeth competition. There is really no other competition where you are forced to really understand what you're capable of and you're really forced to face yourself or um and maybe your fears and your limits or expend on on yourself and i think that experience was one of the most i think i have to use the word life changing for me because it really the whole competition experience defined a moment where i think looking back it gave me this um i think belief and drive and confidence in myself that wow i i can do something and of course i'm not saying afterwards there were no challenges in my life and everything is easy i'm not saying that at all but i think when you know of course there are external things that you know you get concerts people recognize you and and they're all great things but i think in the long scheme of things really getting more uh in touch with what you went through internally and what this competition gave me the kind of laser focus that i was able to achieve and the confidence that i was able to i think access that i maybe didn't know that i had it in me i think was really i think something that i look back to um time to time especially when i think i'm going through a difficult time but also because i really consider belgium as my european home because i did spend about five years there um even before leading up to the pandemic and i am in such i think <sighs> How can I say this? I have such fond memories, not just about the competition, but being a Chappelle, having this incredible amount of support and, and love. And I remember after I played the next day or so that week, I was just walking around taking a bus in Brussels and people recognized me. <laughs> just, yeah, I, I think because too. it has, right? Yeah. So a lot um, of reviews, journalists, a lot of public around here too. It's true. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a real exactly. experience. I think that you you go through that. It's more than just another competition. It really is a national event, and they have you come back. And the nice thing about Queen Elizabeth, from my experience, even though I've only been two years removed is that they want to keep in contact with you they want you to somehow play in belgium whether that be with a belgian national orchestra whether that be a recital in a, in a church or something there's some sort of um a, it's a spider web it's like there's a connection that ties us all together and that's the competition that's that's fantastic um and we'll get to more about what you're doing these days and what you did right after the competition but let's let's hear some of keiko's performance again just so we connect with them what he's doing now with the third movement
question here from JCS Salazar 13. What is it like to have fans all over the world? Well, I'll give you my perspective first of all, but it's, it's, I think it's really cool, especially with the fact that we get to tour to so many different countries. And well, I mean, before COVID, I don't know <laughs> what's going to look like afterwards, but at least getting to know people once at least, and then, and then keeping in touch with them. It's, it's so amazing with the, the ability of the internet now. Christine, you are from Korea, but you studied in Philadelphia since in, at Curtis Institute of Music since you were like a baby. I know that's a famous rumor that goes around, or the famous fact is that you literally have been there, I think, the longest out of anybody, right? Because you went there when you were 10 or something crazy like that, right? So, exactly. and then I you went to Juilliard. Years. Wow, it's amazing. And then you went to Juilliard, and then you went to Brussels, and then you're back and forth now. What is it like for you? to connect and I mean, in general, the, I guess the question is, you're traveling all over the place. What, what does it feel like to be an international soloing cellist? Because cello, you know, it, I think in more recent years and especially in, in, in North America has become more of a soloistic instrument. I think that's a relatively new concept, at least from my perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be that? I think you're definitely right about the fact that cello was, I mean, it's more recent that cello is considered as a solo instrument, for sure. And I must, I have to say that I, I feel extremely fortunate to uh, be able to do what I love and to travel and see the world. But as a cellist, when we travel uh, abroad, we always have to buy an extra C and the, all the headache and nightmare stories that I've gone through and many of my colleagues have experienced always being on the phone trying those are the signs that I think many of us don't don't see so it's not just sparkly um ivory tower um mm. you know but I I feel that I mean there's a cliche saying that music is a a universal language and but I I really believe in that actually, and I think the cliche exists because it's so true. Having lived in different, very different countries, I think there were at times where it was very confusing because I struggled to know myself and to um, figure out my identity because I felt that I didn't have my roots. But I think music is the thing that really helped me feel grounded in those times and that's wherever I am even when I don't speak their language I'm somehow able to create this feeling of union and unity and I take so much pride in that actually because I think that's so special and especially um during this time where there has been so much just pain and uncertainty I think it's brought out how important it is that how necessary it is for us to um, create these opportunities to connect, to create a, a safe environment where we can interact and communicate and share our thoughts and, and feelings. Yeah, it's, it's, I want to talk a little bit more about that later after Keiko finishes his performance, but because a lot of these competitions and musicians come from Europe, North America, US, Canada, or Asia. And you had experience of living in all three and how that might be very confusing in this different system. But we'll get to that after Keiko plays. But Mary Angela, you know, Keiko is almost done with his piece. So let's leave a minute uh, to listen to him. But I want to know what was it like for you to, you know, you're in Europe, go to Texas. Van Cliburn, and then you had management for five years playing concerts, or, I mean, I'm sure you will have more concerts there as well, but during that very intense period of time, what was it like? Was it a different experience to play in America as opposed to being in Europe, or have you already were you already used to that because you played there already in the past? So we, we, we wait for the, for his rent, That's okay. or uh, uh, I just give us a brief answer and then we'll, we can talk more about it. But I definitely want to save just a, the last minute to hear him play. Yes. Well, of course, I, I, I played uh, in five years, uh, even the, 
the public sometimes is a little different. Uh, in the United States, they are a little more exciting immediately. So I have, I, I see a, um, a question. I was like uh, to have fans all over the world. Well, I've been very lucky. United States, I still have friends from Connecticut, Oregon, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Cleveland. So it's wonderful. And, uh, but maybe we can listen just the end of the concerto. Okay, maybe let's listen. Can... Yes, I, I'm let's very listen. Curious about... <laughs> I was just about to say that. here got thousands of people chiming in let's clap and pretend we're a full concert hall right now that was awesome he gave such a strong performance I, I, I think he can miss the the shouting of the people Woo! <laughs> There's always one like, no one screams, right? <laughs> Bravo! Yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Look at that. Okay, going backstage. I remember I was like, give me water, give me water. <laughs> It was so hot on stage. I remember. It looks. Everyone looks very calm. They're not sweating this year. I don't know if they have an air conditioning unit that actually works now or something. But that's awesome. Uh, a big emotion, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Oh my! That moment when you finish. Oof. Exactly. I'm getting Checklist. so emotional. Like... <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's funny, you see some of the orchestra players, and you, I, I recognize some of them in 2007 as well. Like that second violinist principal, he's, I think he was the same orchestra player when you did it, Mary Angela. Okay. I also recognize the woman with the blonde, big hair. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful hair she has. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that was awesome. So I guess for him, that's that's the end of it. I mean. So I can imagine the feelings because I remember going through there. I just felt like, 
ah, oh, I did it. I actually did it. It's finally done. And now actually comes the worst part, waiting for the result. <laughs> the most, I think, stomach turning one because you have absolutely no control. And yet, I don't know about you guys, but I played on the fifth night, which actually was not bad because only was one, one night of agony, of one night of just waiting. But uh, Mary Angela, when, do you remember which day you played night. in the week? First night, I so you had six, uh, five days to wake. Oh, you were the first person to play too. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I remember very well. Yes. <laughs> and I also remember that, um, well, of course, you cannot sleep for six days. No, I'm joking. But, you know, <laughs> but I you find it very wait. funny because you have to wait. You have to wait. And it's like you, you enjoy Brussels for the first time now because you can actually go out. I don't know about these guys because they're stuck in the pandemic. Yeah. But I remember going for an ice cream and it's like, oh, ice cream, ice cream, result, result, ice cream, result, ice cream. It just goes in these flashes all the time, right? It's like, oh, I'm in a competition. Christine, do you remember what you felt right after the competition ended? What did you do? Were you earlier on, middle, near the end of the competition? I think I was... I think I was in the middle, maybe fourth day or so. Um, and, okay, I have to admit that under most circumstances, I don't enjoy waiting. It's true. It, you know, that's a difficult thing to do. But for this specific um, waiting period, I remember just being extremely happy. Because actually, I didn't even mind the waiting because I really felt that I had given it my all and I had done everything I could. I've done my best. So and especially because I knew that, OK, now it's really out of my control and there's nothing I can do. And so I'm just going to enjoy it because I deserve it. And um, I had a wonderful host family I was uh, staying with and. They were just so kind. They took care of me. We ate lots of good food. I got to visit um, different parts of Belgium. I went to, I think, um, Bruges. And it was just, I think, one of the worry-free days of my life, actually. Uh, I mean, that sounds amazing. And you were already living in Brussels at the time, right? Because you were already studying? Or was that after? Yeah, yeah. So in, you must have a lot of friends and family. I mean, family friends, kind of that idea that we're all watching you and supporting you. That must have been really, really exciting. And something that it I've really noticed. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Something I've noticed. Oh, let's just see this question first. Twitch Jonah, has it occurred in the competition or not that the orchestra you're playing with had a different take on a concerto than you would have? Hmm. Mary Angela, why don't, why don't I give this question to you? The take, it means idea, can be. Did they have a different interpretation? Like, let's say you wanted to play your Prokofiev concerto, and this is the interpretation, but orchestra was, it's so different, they weren't ready for it because they have a different idea of it. Yeah. Uh, well, it can be, but mostly with the conductor than the orchestra, probably. And uh, so in that case, uh, we must be a little bit politically correct. Otherwise, it's better to, <laughs> to leave. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, the, the, sometimes, for example, now I tell you a story. Uh, sometimes a, a nice thing is when uh, you play with some very, very good conductor um, and you have the, the end of the cadenzas, uh, for example, in classical concertos or something like that. And uh, they are kind of terrified about the end of the cadenza. This is very nice, actually. And uh, you have to um, keep calm for them and say, no problem, you just need to listen. But they are very famous, maybe a very good conductor. So just, just they are just a little afraid of the end of the cadenza so um it's not not just the same of the the, the question that the different idea you have to balance of course some sometimes in the past um big pianist would have been would have said okay goodbye it's happened with karayan and some and a big pianist i don't remember the name it happened that they, they were not uh, with the same idea and they decide they they decide to leave 
so no concerto because their idea were too different uh, <laughs> but yeah but now we have to now we can i mean i think the best is balancing uh try to balance the idea of course so Course. Maybe Christine can help with the question and Timothy too. Of course. What do you think? Now I do. I give you a question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I want. I want to. I mean, you made a really interesting point, and you know, it's so much of being on stage. Things can happen that don't really happen in rehearsals. You know, what happens in rehearsals, and you get along, and maybe it was such a struggle, but on stage, it's very harmonious because it's almost like you went through that battle. And sometimes when you don't have that battle, you go on stage, you're like, wait, we actually didn't talk this through. But also we're going to put on a clip now, which something I don't think most people expected. So why don't we just roll the clip and show the audience what happened in Christine's performance back in 2017. <laughs> On voyait à l'instant euh, une corde euh, voilà, vient de se casser. Ah mais oui. voilà, oui, c'est le point oui. gâteau fatal. I love the sound. Ça n'a pas supporté. Deux cordes à coup, ça, ça doit être la première. Look at wow. you breaking that string. So that is pretty rare. Two I know, strings. Look at you. Two strings? Oh my Fantastic. god, you're violent. Have you been on steroids and or something? G and, <laughs> G and C strings. The okay, that is string. that is a phenomenon. That is a phenomenon because those strings don't break usually. Those are the they're they're as thick as a USB cable sometimes. Too much <laughs> exactly. power. Actually, no. Yeah. So woman I mean, power, right? Woman yeah. power. That we, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later too. But what what went through your mind when that happened? Were you you look pretty calm? You're just like, oh, let's just let's just change strings. <laughs> but what went through your mind? So I've gotten this question many times, actually. Um, I think, I mean, I think there was a sense of relief in a way also, because something that I didn't expect to happen happened. And um, I had to, of course, stop playing. I had to go to backstage and put new strings on. Um, and never you know had i broken two strings in, in a concert and especially for a competition but i just took it as an opportunity okay now you know it's out let's just focus on making music and whatever happened happened and i'm not gonna dwell on it and i'm just going to do my best and that's what was really going through my head but even during those moments i I mean, that's why I think the competition has left such a um, fuzzy feeling in my heart because a luthier came backstage. She helped me change the strings. I was running up and down to the dressing room in my dress, like like a headless <sighs> chicken, actually, <laughs> and <laughs> just trying to figure things out. But even under those circumstances, people were there to help me. Um, I played with Maestro Denev and he just told me, you know, don't freak out, take the time you need we're here for you, take as much time as you need. And I mean, even the audience members, they laughed with me, you know, it wasn't something to be um, embarrassed of. So I think it was, I sort of felt the room just kind of go and everybody relaxed, you know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like you actually mm -hmm. heard um, people laugh. And I think yeah. that will be remembered as such a special moment. Yeah, I think I think that's the first time I've ever seen anyone break two strings, especially the C string. That's pretty rare. So, I mean, I can only imagine. Did you start the whole piece again, or did you just start halfway? Actually, it happened maybe only a few minutes into the piece, so I started from mm. the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone yes. earlier on said, "Christine's too powerful for a for a cello." It's kind of like that. You remember Shrek? There was that movie. It was like, oh, I'm too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy for my shirt. It's like, oh, I'm too too powerful for my cello. Too powerful for my cello. <laughs> yeah. No, speaking about power, I mean, this is something that I think statistic-wise, I don't think we get to hear this very often. But something is that, at least for pianists, 
there's a lot of imbalance. I mean, not to say there's balance or imbalance, but it just tends to be a lot more men in piano competitions. And then for violin, it tends to be more women. I remember in Indianapolis competition 2006, there was in the final round, it was all women. All the semifinals was all women, except for one guy, which was August and Hadelik. And then he ended up winning. But a cello seemed to be pretty balanced, it seemed. I think um, not enough. It was only one session to draw that conclusion. But I mean, just for piano, Mary Angela, is that something that is a well-known fact? Did you notice that? Or is it? I noticed that this edition, there are no women. <laughs> 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 I mean, there were uh, there were a few women, and then no, no one in the final. I'm <laughs> very little sorry. Yeah. I feel a little sorry about that. But uh, well, is there a reason? Um, what, what do you mean? If it's do, do you think there's a? There, is there any reasonings of that? Is I mean, can you conclude actually, to an idea of why that might be? Well, actually, I didn't expect it because women are very very much powerful now they want to you know achieve uh, and uh, they really want to compete and be compared with the uh, men so it's very strange actually i don't have an answer for that mm. uh, for example in my edition we were i think six and six or something like that there were uh, a lot of women and uh, also a uh, good balance in general. So um, I really don't know why in this edition there are so few pianists. Um, uh, maybe they are doing uh, too much conducting than pianists. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. There's a lot of women conducting these. That's awesome to see. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some people say, I mean, when I did ask a few of my colleagues, I, I think this might have been not a true fact, but some people suggest you need bigger hands and this might be a physical thing. But I don't think that's true because you see people, you know, you guys can, I mean, it's about the stretch, not about how big it is at some point, isn't it? Well, uh, in the piano, you mean, well, yes, of course. I mean, I think it's like in, even in the cello, I mean, you need a lot of uh, working on your left hand. And mm -hmm. so um, there are a lot of repertoire you can choose as well. So I don't think it's about power. Women are, That's true. Lot, they have a lot of power as well. Um, yeah. This question is very interesting now because, you know, when I was young, um, uh, this matter was much more involved in, in situations. So now it's, mm -hmm. it's a little strange even to talk about because it's like women and men are basically the same no so yeah. it's interesting i i really don't have idea but i think that women there are a lot of um women pianists that are star of the piano um well of, of course it's something that we are building with uh, absolutely the absolutely and, the and christine of music absolutely i agree with you and Christine, what about you? I mean, Queen Elizabeth's cello competition only happened once so far, so it's kind of hard to draw that conclusion. But in general, would you say, is there something to take note about what gender, or is that something you didn't even think about? Actually, this issue is something that I've thought about quite a bit. Um, in the, uh, the past cello division, we were actually, there was a huge imbalance in the finals, there were only two women, including myself, and the rest were men. And I think at most um, most big international competitions I've seen, there is a trend. There tends to be more uh, male players than female. Um, if we are just speaking from a physical perspective of playing the cello, I think there it is possible that uh, men have a natural um, advantage, actually, only because of the biological things. You know, may, men have more um, muscle. I'm not saying that we have to use our muscles, but I think even with, how do you say, um, having stamina in these things, I think we, as women, have less muscle, so we were we are more likely get to get tired. And there are so many things in in before you get to the stage actually there are so many things that we have to consider because carrying around a cello all the time that weighs about seven to eight kilos um you know 
I think that weighs down on you and mm -hmm. maybe our muscles are tighter just because of that. And I think also as a female body, we experience these hormonal changes and there are things that we do have to, that are not maybe addressed, but we are constantly dealing with actually. Mm -hmm. um, physically. And I think if you look at, I'm not comparing a music competition to Olympics, but, you know, ice skaters, they don't compete women and men together. And it's maybe not the best example, but just physically speaking, there are um, differences. And I think, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but there are definitely obvious just differences between male and female. Um, but I think, I think, do you think there are still a long way to go? Of course, we've come a long way with creating a more uh, fair ground for everyone um, in the music world and everywhere, every other aspect as well. But I think this is a conversation that we need to continue to have. Um, sometimes it's going to feel like maybe women are getting even more um, like forward just because it's been so behind for us you know but i think i'm sure we are on a good path and we'll find um a happy balance but yeah, you know I if definitely... i Timothy, i don't know if you remember the geneva competition during uh, 90 probably 96 when uh, the argerich won it there was uh, two categories i remember the female and the male so maybe this will really? be really yeah I I'm quite yes. I'm quite sure because um, I um, I also studied with the French professor Dominique Merlet, and um, he was uh, actually he won uh, the the male um, category when Marta Argerich won the female category. See, yes, I I thought around the sixties. Mm -hmm. So probably maybe this could be also an idea for the future. That's something to definitely look into. Very interesting. I did not know that they had something like that. Uh, Mary Angela, we have a question. If you could please answer this one, because you're the expert here. Do you see on the screen? How hard is for pianists? How hard is for pianists during this competition when you don't get to play your own instruments? So some people has not very good own instruments. So, <laughs> so <laughs> the, uh, well, you know what. <laughs> Well, the, uh, and sometimes we play, we, uh, well, competition, we are very young, so maybe we, we practice in the school, academies and whatever. So, of course, there are great pianos, uh, great instruments, but not always, not all the time. Sometimes we have to practice on the upright. Or maybe we have nice host families who help us to find the good, good pianos, good instruments. And, uh, uh, but during the competition, this high, very high level competition, uh, of course, the competition provides you good instruments, so you can practice very well. Of course, I think that is much um, is not about competition. It's about uh, uh, your, uh, the work on yourself, about the sound, about the technical uh, skills. I think when you start to have your own life uh, after competition, after school, you you try to build your your life, your career, your musical idea, and you can also have the instrument that you want. Well, of mm -hmm. course, I think we can get much better because you try. We 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 get our ideas, and I think it's very important for an artist to grow. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Thank you for answering that question. And since we didn't get a chance to look at Kegel's portrait earlier, and he's going to be joining us to, to, to have an interview with us, let's watch his portrait. But before that, let we, can we just uh, encourage the audience right now, please write in the, in the comment section, in the, in the chat box, what questions you might want to ask Kego, because he's going to join us in a couple of minutes. And we're going to go into his portrait that we missed out earlier today. So let's, let's turn on that. La musique contemporaine, c'est un défi pour le cerveau. Bonjour, je m'appelle Keigo Mukawa. J'ai 28 ans, je suis japonais et j'habite en France. Ça peut être Chopin ou, ou bien Ravel. Ça 
ça peut être 0 ou ça peut être 10, 10 heures. Mais ça dépend vraiment. C'est aussi important de ne pas jouer tous les jours pour moi. Pendant le concours, je travaille quand même beaucoup, 6 heures, 7 heures. Je lis pas mal de livres. Sinon, euh, ma passion de la vie, c'est le café et le vin. Je, je consacre énormément de temps pour le café et le vin pendant la journée. C'est vraiment, je veux être presque professionnel de, de, euh, dans ce domaine. Je ne sais pas, l'aigu. Je ne sais pas si j'ai le droit de toucher ça. Ce genre de choses, ça, ça existe énormément dans la musique contemporaine. On peut avoir un son complètement différent. que j'ai ai énormément aimé. Après, il y a mon ami Adèle. C'est ce que j'étais en train de regarder juste avant de venir ici. Merci pour le chocolat. Surtout récemment que j'ai commencé à regarder les films un peu anciens, de, de films français. À l'âge de 6 ans, j'ai composé un petit morceau. J'ai composé pas mal de choses quand j'étais plus jeune. Maintenant, j'ai un petit peu arrêté, mais j'ai toujours d'intérêt. J'ai découvert beaucoup de grands compositeurs. Devant eux, je me sens un peu nul. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, mais je sens tellement de sympathie avec une musique de Chopin. Surtout sa musique tardive. Il a souffert beaucoup par sa maladie à la fin de sa vie. Il a créé beaucoup de choses à la fin de vie très sensibles comme... Je comprends qu'il était très fragile à la fin de sa vie, mais je ne sais pas pourquoi, mais je, je sens beaucoup de sympathie. Almost makes me forget that not everyone speaks English. That's my America-centric view. <laughs> And that's a question I have to ask, I guess, Mary Angela, first of all. I mean, I mean, learning English, it seems like, I mean, of course, that's lingua franca right now, but how important do you think it is to be able to speak English in, as, a, as a musician? Well, everyone speaks English, and uh, so we have to, to to do it. And not only music; even if you, um, I don't know, telephone, computer, whatever. I mean, basically, the first impact is English. So it's mm. total, it's you cannot live, you cannot survive, actually. So it's some way That's you true. have to do it. And also, for example, in Italy, um, because uh, the. Um, he talked about French movies. In Italy, we have um, all the foreign movies uh, translated in Italian. Actually, mm. the actors that uh, speak, sometimes they are very, very, they are, they are fantastic. So sometimes it's even better than listening the original one. But now the television put uh, the original uh, movies with subtitle. And uh, this helps a lot the population, you know, uh, citizen, to to get used to English yeah. much more. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. We have a question here from Ten 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 Tricks. Okay, so Maria Angela, est-ce que tu pouvais parler un petit en français pour us? Can you speak a lot in French? Un petit peu, un petit peu. Christine, I don't do such things for free. <laughs> 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 send, send us, you know, you can you can send us bit bitmojis, right? I don't know if you can do bitmojis on here yet, but you can send us a bitmoji, and then we'll send that to Christine, and she'll say something in French. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
<laughs> Wait, so how many languages do you speak, Christine? Because you lived all over the world. Unfortunately, my French is really not at the level that I like it to be. Um, mm. But my mother tongue is Korean, actually. And um, I lived in the States for a very long time. So um, in a way, I feel that my my skills at all these languages, English, Korean, and a bit of French is all sort of at a okay level, but not at a great level, if you know what I mean, because I've had to sort of change back and forth. So my writing in Korean is not as good as in English, but you know, all these, so I wish I could combine the three and just speak it, make my Christine language. <laughs> yeah, Christine language. I mean, you, you speak, I mean, I remember hearing you speak French in Verbier. I think that was pretty impressive. So yeah, I mean, she doesn't do it for free. So please send a bitmoji or something. I don't know exactly what it's called, like a Twitch something. You can send, you know, you know what it is, right? Chat in the chat box. Please send us a Twitch uh, bitmoji and then she'll say something and French will force her to. But that's that's awesome. And, and Mariangela, how many languages do you speak? Well, except English, I must say that I was studying French and uh, German. I did some examination, but sometimes I'm too lazy to speak with people in French and German, and I almost forget. But I like I, I like a lot of leader songs, so I I know some uh, few the, uh, several words about the two languages, even Spanish that is close to Italian. But you know, it's not the same knowing some uh, knowing words and put together phrases and whatever. So mainly Italian and English, mm. just a little yeah. bit of French and German. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I grew up um, learning French because I had to in school in Canada, but it was very badly taught to us. And even when we did learn French, it was avec avec l'accent québécois, so it's not very. Uh, clean French, as they may say it, a very lot, lots of slang, and um, sometimes remember it's like that was an English word that we just said, but just in a like flat tire, like a flat tire in a car. There was like, hey, uh, bonjour, j'ai un flat tire. <laughs> I have a flat tire <laughs> basically in my car. <laughs> so it was really, really funny. With the French but, accent. Uh, no, I, with the Quebecois, and they're not even like a French accent. It's a Quebecois accent. So it's kind of it was it was interesting. But I, I, I come to realize at least the writing part is similar. And um, mm. but yeah, this is it's so, so interesting to have a performing career and, and understanding. I think it really we're so un, you're so unique because and we take that for granted that we get to go to so many countries and English, luckily, is that language that binds us all together. And uh, it's just. Yeah. All right. And I just have. Oh, Kego! Hello, bravo! Felicitations! Congratulations! Hi. Thank you for joining us tonight on Twitch. How do you feel, first of all? Oh, uh, first of all, yeah, just happy, 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 relieved. So you, did yeah. you think that? Yeah, relieved? yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, good. I was worrying about, good. yeah. So it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I mean, we have some questions to ask you and, and Christine and Marangela mm -hmm. will, will uh, feel free to ask them when you when you're ready. But first of all, uh, we, we're wondering, we have a question in the Twitch chat box. Why did you choose the second concerto by Prokofiev for your final round? Uh, yeah, actually, I have a lot of choice, but uh, it's difficult to explain. But when I I participate in uh, in a in a competition. I always choose the second. Uh, no, no, no. The, the third concert of Prokofiev. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I it was, sounded. But I was already. Uh, sorry, sorry. I always wanted to run this concerto, so. I decided to run this concert for this com competition. So this is your first time to perform it? And actually, uh, fortunately, I had a chance to play that uh, one year ago in Japan. 
but it had to be the first time for me to play this concerto in this concert, but this, this edition has to be postponed. So it was my second time to play that. Ah, okay. I mean, you looked so calm and, and so focused. Did it, was really? there any moment when you were playing that you were like, this is my first time, or was it like, you know it so well already and you were very comfortable? It seems that like you're very comfortable on stage tonight. No, was that, it, is that true? It was, I, no. No? <laughs> <laughs> no, for me, it was always thrilling to play that. Yeah, very I thrilling. I was always yeah. nervous, but finally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. I don't know how. I mean, do you have yeah. any, question, any questions, Mariangela or Christine, that you have to ask um, Keigo for tonight? Well, I'm very curious to hear what about... Sorry, 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 sorry. Right. <laughs> sorry, Christine. I was, I, <laughs> I was curious about uh, Mantovani piece. If you have been in contact with this music already before. Not, uh, not with this piece, I other knew, pieces. You know, just I knew a little bit his style because he was the director of conservatory in Paris. I'm a I'm student there for seven years, so he was there, but we haven't met personally, so just I've... Yeah, I knew already his style a little bit. But I think this music was yeah, quite French sound, so yeah, I felt quite comfortable to play that. Yes, we, I can yeah. hear it. Bravo. Yeah. yeah. And, bravo. And before we get to Christine's question, we just have one question from the chat box. How and where did you learn to speak French so well? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I spent in Paris for seven years, so it comes naturally like this. It was amazing. It was amazing. We were just talking but, about it because yeah. it was very impressive. Very, very impressive. Ah. Uh, oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we end um, a few more questions, but Christine, if you have a question, why don't you go ahead? Thank you very much for your performance. <laughs> Thank you. My question is not musical, but mm -hmm. you mentioned in your portrait that your passion is in coffee and wine. Yeah. And <laughs> I also happen to like those two things very much. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could share with us um, your favorite beans, favorite kind of beans and a type of wine uh -huh. um, these days. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, it's, yeah. I know a lot of things <laughs> and uh, it's difficult. Just one. Do you already Each. know the different? Yeah, okay. Uh, for start, it's maybe good to taste the difference between the Bordeaux and Bourgogne. So the, the two biggest red wine in France, it's Bordeaux and uh, Bourgogne. So it will be interesting for start to, to taste the difference between to region, I think. Mm. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and how about for coffee? <laughs> coffee. Ah, uh, I don't know if you have already tried single origin coffee. It means the beans is made in a single country. So it means it, it is not the brand coffee, branded coffee. 
if you no try Starbucks. it, you can discover the character, yeah, character of <laughs> each country. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you come, you come to the US and we'll, I'll show you around Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> we'll try them, their coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right, I mean, thank and, you. And, and, yeah, just two more questions for you, Keigo. What was it like to be at the Chappelle yeah. this year? Did you enjoy your time uh, learning the new imposed piece? Yeah, actually, it was wonderful. You really yeah, yeah, brought yeah, out yeah. these colors. Mm -hmm. You really, I thought that your performance tonight was very colorful. I, I heard things that oh, really? I did not hear over the past two nights. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I tried to, yeah, create some colors. But this, this, yeah, this seven days of preparation in the chapel was uh, um, unforgettable moment for me there. The other candidates. Yeah, yeah, it was it's great, uh, great also. Also kind and. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, just one last question. The dernier question for, for vous is, did you get your cell phone back? Your mobile phone? No, no, not not yet, not yet. Are you, actually, are you waiting yeah. for it? Are you nervous? <laughs> actually, I'm worrying about how many messages I have got in, in, in a week. But yeah, yeah. A lot of fun. Maybe I have my phone in, in ten minutes like this. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Keiko, so much for your performance tonight. Thank you for all of your hard work, your passion, and thank you for speaking with us as well. Good luck. Bon chance and bon soirée. Thank you, Keigo. Take a Thank rest. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Yeah, no, it's it's really sweet. I know English is not as uh, not a comfortable language for him, but he did amazing. Still, I don't think many English speakers could do what he did <laughs> in French or anything else. But I want to thank you so much, Mariangela and Christine, for joining us tonight and helping give us a little bit of your insights of what it's like to be a musician from the past doing the Queen Elizabeth competition, what it was like during that time, and, and also now what you guys are doing. And where can we find you all online? Where can these people that are joining us right now, what's the platform that you most frequently update your audience with that we can follow? Christine? Ah, me first. Um, you can find me on Instagram. That's where I'm most um, active on. And actually, if you're interested, I did a, uh, we did a reversal with Timothy and I, I was the one interviewing him. And it's a project, passion project I started during the Corona times because I felt so disconnected from everybody. And uh, it's given me a lot of joy and um, inspiration to always learn from people around me, and I intend to continue. So my handle is cello underscore. Maybe somebody can write it on the chat for me. <laughs> um, Lita. We'll put it in the chat box. And, thank you. And yes, I would love to have you, uh, Maria Angela, as well, since we met this way, if you are on Instagram and yeah. That's where you can find me. And also on YouTube, you can, if you'd like to hear me play, I'm available to be heard there as well. Awesome. And Mariangela, can where I, can I'm the audience- I'm so audi sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go on, go on. I'm so sorry. I need to make a tiny self promotion just because I'm really, really happy about it. I just, uh, my debut album came out last Friday and that's also available on, Spotify and and YouTube. I hope you enjoy it. Actually, uh, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about that. So I, I did realize you just recorded this with Henry Kramer, who's also a past former laureate of the piano competition. Um, and we're going to have him join us on Friday. So check them out. You're going to hear Christine and Henry Kramer, you know, both past laureates. And you definitely don't want to miss that out. It's on Spotify and assume Apple Music as well. And it's probably on YouTube as well, YouTube music. You know, they usually upload just the exactly. audio. So definitely check them out. And she'll be posting, I'm sure, on your Instagram where you can find that directly. So don't miss out on the chance to listen to um, our fellow laureates of the competition. Awesome. So please do that. Mariangela, 
just with the time remaining, can you share, where, where do you, do you have social media and where can we find you? Yes, I'm using Facebook and uh, Instagram with my name, of course, Mariangela Vacatello. And uh, in you, on YouTube channel, you can also find some old videos from past competition with the orchestra, so something very interesting. And uh, of course, uh, even my website, www.mariangelavacatello.com. Um, uh, and uh, well, I can talk. My last, my new recording will be available in September with the Chopin and Schubert. So stay tuned on my fantastic. social media. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Thanks that's, for that's fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Of course, it's such a pleasure to have all of you here. And thank you, everybody, for all of the questions that we've had. We had a great crowd tonight, and we're going to be coming back tomorrow at 8 p.m. Uh, and my brother Nikki Chui, who is a former laureate in 2012 will be joining us tomorrow and we're going to have a special guest as well and you know i know we, we're doing this six days in a row but every night it's a little bit different and make sure you do watch the whole stream because we do have some prizes for saturday that we won't announce until saturday that you could possibly enter to win so definitely do that 8 p.m tomorrow also make sure you follow us on the social media handles we really would appreciate it if you could follow us you know one like one subscribe on youtube instagram means a lot to us so make sure you do that and other than that i'll see you all tomorrow thank you again all right good night everyone thanks Hello. everyone Merci. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. see i i did it for free <laughs> <laughs>